it's such a pleasure to be here. I am so grateful for, uh, to Design and Daba for inviting me. Um, so, a couple of years ago, I made a film called Rafiki, and it's based on a short story called Jambula Tree by Monica Arakde Nyeko. And when I made it, it was really just an ode to love. I really wanted to tell a love story because growing up, I hadn't seen images of um, us as Africans in love. Europeans were falling in love, Americans were falling in love, everybody was falling in love, but Africans were not. And I really wanted to be able to add our experience of being in love to cinema. So I made Rafiki. Unfortunately, because Rafiki is a love story between two young women, it was banned in Kenya. But just to give you some context, the head of the classification board who banned it also saw an image of two male lions mounting <laughs> and said that those lions needed counseling <laughs> and needed to be separated and then went on to say the only way they could have learned this behavior is by watching other tourists who had come to the national parks and were making love, and that's where they learned it from. <laughs> so, to be super clear, I really don't know what to say. So, um, <laughs> but when we spoke, um, because I had the opportunity to meet him and his board, and when we spoke about the film, they asked me to change the ending because they felt the ending was too hopeful and too happy and asked if I could have a more remorseful ending. That was their word. And if I change the ending to be more remorseful, then they would give me an 18 rating. When I said I would not change the ending, they banned the film. So I started to investigate stories from Africa about joy, because I believe that joy and hope are part of our culture, are part of our tradition, are part of who we are and our identity. And as I went back and started looking in modern and, in, and further back, I realized that there's more images and more stories of joy than remorse. So in Kenya, we have this amazing artist called Picha Marangi, and he does these really beautiful pieces that he kind of styles and photographs and everything. The reason that these pictures really spoke to me were not only because they're glorious, but also because they were, they were made in a really beautiful place in Trukana. Now, Trukana has been a place that has really captured me in many, many different ways, uh, apart from the jewelry and the beadwork and the colors and, and the fact that it is one of the last remaining, it has one of the last remaining desert fresh ocean lakes um, that is slowly being dying because of a, of a dam. But um, it has this amazing culture and heritage. And, and I don't know how you feel, but I am always kind of curious about um, things that I, I find out about the places that I'm from that I didn't know before. And I almost, I almost feel like somebody was keeping knowledge from me. And one of the knowledge from Trukana, and, and just to give context to people, because you, you may not be familiar with where Trukana is, Trukana is slightly east of Wakanda on the map. Just a short distance east of Wakanda is where Trukana is. And Trukana is a truly magical place because it, let me, so I just discovered that there was a Burana calendar. Now the Burana calendar was, was created um, before 300 BC, right? And the Burana calendar is made up of 12 months of the year, and approximately each month has 29.5 days of a month, right? Which makes it 354 days of the year. Now, this calendar existed 1,800 years before the current calendar that we use. And the way this calendar works is it looks at the moon cycle. And because Kenya's on the equator, the, the days and the nights are, 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 are quite the same, right? But what the calendar does is that it looks at when 
where the moon rises and the constellation or planets or group of stars that rises near that moon. And because there's particular stars that, that rise with the moon once every 12 days, they would use that to predict the calendar. Right? And what they do, the Barana, is that instead of having uh, weeks, they have a different name for every day of the month. So if you were to ask them, they would be able to tell you what day of the month it is, depending on where the moon is situated next to a particular constellation, group of stars, or planet. They also, in Trukana, have these nine basalt pillars, and they use those nine basalt pillars to see the moon shadows and where the moon shadows fall, and if they can't tell by just looking into the sky, they look at the shadows on the floor, and they're able to tell you what day of the month it is and what month of the year it is, which I thought was an extraordinary thing that has been happening. Uh, for a long time. And this is just one of the many experiences of joy um, and what I have come to term as Afro bubblegum, which is fun, fierce, and frivolous ideas of ourselves as Africans. Just south of Wakanda and, and Shukana is, um, lives this amazing artist in Ethiopia called Zawashkin. And Zawashkin is this extraordinary um, artist who, when I asked him about his work, he explained that he is using the tradition, he's Somali living in, in Ethiopia, and he is using the tradition of his, the women in his lineage who would um, dress themselves very elaborately every single day, would put jewelry on even if they were just staying home. And they would be these amazing, they would just like, and, and, and he said that his grandmother every Saturday would put henna on her hands and or reapply henna on her hands in these beautiful intricate patterns because she wanted to make sure that she had an experience of being beautiful every single day whether or not she was leaving the house. And one of the things that saved many Somali families during the Civil War was the fact that the women wore all their gold on their bodies. So when they were fleeing, they were able to flee with their gold and retain the wealth of the family. He's just incredible. And when I spoke to him, I also asked him about if he was ever influenced by the, um, the, the Sur Surmi tribe, who are these beautiful people who would paint, and I've seen, I'm sure you've seen many pictures of them, where they have these beautiful, gorgeous headdresses, and they would paint themselves every single day when, um, when they're going to herd cattle, or they're going to... Um, just spend their day, they would, they would paint these really beautiful, intricate patterns on themselves as just, as just a beautific beautification ritual that had nothing to do with anything other than expressing their joy and, their, and the way that they lived their life. And I thought this was an extraordinary process um, that also is, is reminiscent of some really scarification processes that are quite intricate and beautiful, of um, the jewelry that Maasai people wear um, that, has, that has nothing to do with ceremonies. Like, it, it's not, you're not doing it because you're going to uh, a marriage or this is just how they like to express themselves through beauty. And this idea, that this temporal idea of beauty that would only last the day, that you would paint yourself in the morning and then it would be gone by night, was something that I really, that just gave me such hope and courage about how we see ourselves and how we should be part of a ritual, an everyday ritual of joy and beauty. Now, I, in... Um, I don't know if you guys I don't know if you guys know these comics. They're called African photo comics. 
Now, these African photo comics were another celebration of joy, and they were released between the 60s and the 80s. Um, and um, they were hugely popular, mostly because we all love to see a man in spandex. <laughs> and they were also the most pan-African pieces of work that I have come across. So they were written in Nigeria, they were shot in Swaziland, they were edited in South Africa, and they were distributed, printed and distributed in Kenya, Ghana, and South Africa by Drum Magazine. And what people would do is that they would line up round the bend, waiting for their uh, recent issues of Son of Samsung, Cobra, and The Spear. And these were glorious images of us. And remember, these was from the 60s to the 80s. So this was during apartheid. This was during uh, when people, this was right after the, we were going through independence in Kenya. So this was really a way of people imagining themselves as superheroes, even though their everyday life didn't necessarily show their superhero-ness. Um, but the fact that these pan-African images of joy and these photo comics were coming out around the world was such an extraordinary like, vision to me that I just wanted to be able to acknowledge them um, and really just like celebrate them in, because they, they have just, they have such life. And when you read them, they're just like these incredible pieces. I mean, uh, they could be rewritten with a little more of a feminist slant now, but at the time, I think that they still had a really huge impact of us seeing ourselves as people of radical hope. And there's other cultures that I came across. Um, so uh, the Wadabe people have this festival called the Garawal Festival. And the Garawal Festival has all these men, after, during the harvest, put this beautiful makeup on, wiggle their faces, stand in lines, and try and attract the attention of the judges. And the judges are the women who would walk around them judge the men, and if, they were, if the men were lucky enough, they would win a prize, and the prize was a night of pleasure with the judge. <laughs> <laughs> but this idea of these picturesque black men with, um, with makeup and with happiness and pulling their faces to make themselves more attractive and laughing and attracting these women was such an incredible idea of how we have the opportunity to see the black men in our countries, to see the black men in our nations, to see the black men in our, in our worlds as people of joy, as people of creativity, as people who inspire more than what we have been constantly told or the images that have bombarded us of, um, of pain or suffering or anger. This is what we are. This is what we always have been, radiant, curious beings. And the reason that I include them is so that we can have a different perception of who we are, who we've always been, and how we go out into the world and see the people of color in our neighborhoods as people of joy and radiance. And then we have the Jengu. The Jengu are from Cameroon. The Jengu is a mermaid from Cameroon. I didn't know we had mermaids on our continent. So when I found the Jengu, I was super amazed and glad, and also I became the hero in my daughter's uh, life. The Jengu have bushy hair, gap tooth, they're always giggling, they're considered water spirits. They live in the oceans and the seas and the rivers. People worship them and the people who worship them are known to get good luck. But they're also allies of people who, are, um, who, who protect nature. 
And what was extraordinary to me about the Jenggu and why I thought them of as curious, fantastical, amazing people, um, it's just because of, look, they're glorious. <laughs> and because we need to imagine that there's more of us who can conjure up the courage of the water and the power of the water like the Jenggu can and change nature as a result. So, when next time you go to Cameroon, ask about the Jenggu and imagine that the lineage of the Cameroonians has the idea of water spirits who show themselves in this beautifully curious African way. So more recently, in 2009, I made a film called Pumzi. It was actually shot here in Cape Town. And um, Pumzi is a film about a young girl, Asha, who is also kind of inhabits the Jengu spirit in as much as she is a, an advocate for nature. And while I was creating it, the idea of having a hopeful ecological film was something that was very, very important to me. The idea of showing images of us as being mothers of Mother Nature was an incredibly important story for me to tell. And the idea of women, and especially black women, being at the forefront of that was something that I had to tell as somebody who has always been a fan and a lover of Professor, the late Professor Wagari Mathai. And somebody who, who was somebody who went out and planted trees, and her act of planting trees was seen as a revolutionary act because the moment you plant trees, you come across land issues. And so when she started to plant trees and she was considered a dissident, I, even when I was young and watching her, all I could do was celebrate her courage and celebrate the way that she, she moved through the world. And when I had an opportunity to tell my own story, I told a science fiction story about Asha, who lives in the inside world because the outside is dead. And as part of the inside world, she's come to create a natural virtual museum because that is her only access to nature. But one day she receives a piece of soil, and in this soil that she thinks is alive from every test that she does, the soil that she gets is alive, and she plants a seed and the seed starts to grow. And she has to escape the inside world to go outside for it um, to live. The film is currently playing at the Zeit Mocha and is part of the African Futurist series. So if you do have a chance, go watch it there. And if not, it's somewhere online, but I'm not the person who put it up. So if anybody asks, I did not pirate my own work. But go watch it anyway. <laughs> and then we have the beautiful Ninki Nanka. And the Ninki Nanka are from Gambia. They're dragons from Gambia. Again, I did not know we had dragons in our, in our continent. And what is so glorious about these dragons is that they were so famed and people knew them and they were so curious that in 2006, there were UK dragon hunters that were sent to Gambia to try and find a real Ninki Nanka still in existence and to interview people and to collect testimonies of people who had spoken about the Ninki Nanka. And I thought this Ninki Nanka was an extraordinary thing because it has a long neck that is, that is described as similar to the giraffe. It had three horns on the top of its head. It has an icon right on its forehead. It has the face of a horse and then and lives in swamps. There's also stories about naughty children who would go around the swamps and would be swallowed by the Ninki Nanka. But apart from that, it had glassy scales and could sometimes spit fire. That's an incredible curiosity about what we have always had, the fantasy we've always had as part of our nation's, uh, about a, a part of our co continent's um, history. And these Ninkinanka have been 
they haven't been discovered yet, but I feel like there's still hope. But these Ninkinanka have always been mythical creatures that denoted hope, joy, as well as the ability to transform. And what I recently learned, not only two days ago, is that the Kosa also believe that they have a dragon, and it's called the Impundulu. And the Impundulu sometimes is seen to, to be a dragon as well, and also can be known to spit fire, but is a shapeshifter, and also and, and used as a witch's apprentice. So this is, the idea of dragons is not something that has come from the East. It has obviously been something that's part of, been part of our culture and heritage in different parts of the continent. And to only, to own, to be able to glorify the Ninkinanka and to be able to glorify the ideas of um, our past our, has, is, is just something that really resonates with the idea of trying to prove more than our ideas of suffering and pain, but really the ideas of our exuberance and creativity. Uh, I'll show you a little bit of the film of Rafiki before I talk a little more about Let's it. Let's make a pact that we will never be like any of them down there. Instead, we're gonna be Something real? Yes. Something real. Yeah. Hitting at the corn, me and Susie know. We ain't got no worries, we are looking like the odd. Yeah, they can turn around. That part is a bit of an attack. The circle bank, a mortgage. And then we use the Vitumil die too. Season of Vitukilam to attack, Kenna. Doesn't she just look like a proper woman? Look at you. You're nothing. No exam results are out. I get to be a doctor. Yes. I can get a scholarship. Yes. What's your MCA? What are you talking about? I don't know. But it's not a matter of fact. There are people who are in Kenya who are in the government. Because of their own Just a typical Kenyan girl. So when we made Rafiki, we didn't know, well, we expected some of the problems that were going to kind of that the were coming, um, especially when we started editing the film. But before we went into the film, we were very careful about our approach to the film. So in Kenya, when you're making a film, you apply for a license, and to apply for a license, you have to give in the script, which we did. And uh, luckily, nobody read it. But <laughs> we did hand in the license. Right, and we got uh, we got the permission to be able to watch. I mean, to 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 film it. But as part of that, we really had to be careful about how we talked to the actors, how we made sure that they had a support system, etc. and so forth, as we made the film. And then after the film, everything everything started happening. So while we were editing the film, the head of the classification board, you remember him with the lions, the head of the classification board uh, banned five cartoons in Kenya, and that's when we were in the edit, and that's when I knew that things were possibly going to get really bad. Um, and he banned the cartoons for promoting homosexual values, and this was Hey Arnold and uh, Adventure Time, because those, uh, yes, <laughs> yes. Um, and, um, and that's when we started to worry a bit. But when the film was banned, we knew that we had to push back. Because the laws that banned the film are colonial laws. We created a constitution in 2010. 
And in our constitution, it says freedom of expression. So when the film was banned, we took the classification board to court. And we managed to get the ban lifted for seven days. And for seven days, the film was played in Kenya. Thank you. And over the seven days, people had the opportunity to see themselves. And while we talk a lot about representation and making sure that we're seen, there's nothing more just poignant than somebody coming to you and say, I saw myself. I felt seen. I felt acknowledged. I didn't feel like I existed until I saw myself. It's the same thing that we have to do with joy. We have to see ourselves as people of joy. And there's a friend named George Gashara who says, audiences are, he said something that, it, it was really hurtful when I heard it, but I, I, I know, now know it to be true. He says, audiences deserve the movies that they watch. So while the Kenya Film Classification Board were the reason my film was banned, the audience is the reason that it doesn't play in Kenya because people are not advocating for it. And as an audience member, if you want to see more people of color on your screens, if you want to hear more voices of diversity, then it is your responsibility, not ours only as filmmakers and artists and as creators to fight, but for you to support. And the way that you do support is going to see a film. And I'm not saying that you even have to like the film, because I have a friend who says, you don't wake up in the morning and want to watch an African film because it's always so full of pain and suffering. And that's not what the intention is. And that's why we're creating more Afro bubblegum films of fun, fierce, and frivolity that are full of imagination and joy. But when you do see a non-white male create a film, buy the ticket. Go out and buy the ticket. If there's a non-binary person as the lead or behind the film, buy the ticket. You don't have to watch it, just buy the ticket because we need the data. Do it for the data. <laughs> So that the next time I am trying to make a film of joy with people of color, I can say, look at the data that supports it. Because the only thing that we've had in our recent history is Black Panther. And Black Panther cannot be the only film that we use to explain the reason why diversity matters on our screens. It cannot be the only thing. There are stories of joy to be told, there are stories of hope to be told, and they're to be told by us. And the only way that we can do that is if you support us. So that is your responsibility, because I am doing mine. I am suing my government so that you can watch the film. Do your part. Do your part. We're not a remorseful people. And the same way James Baldwin said, uh, your, our crowns have been bought and paid for. All we have to do is wear them. Our joy has been present throughout our lives, throughout our histories, throughout our cultures, throughout our legends. We are not a remorseful people. All we have to do is claim it. So help me claim joy for all of us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.